Hi, welcome to the World Poetry Cafe. This is the family tent. My name is Roger Stevens. Today I'm going to be reading lots of animal poems. So today is a sort of an animal theme. And I'm going to give you some really, really good ideas for writing your own animal poems. So that will be coming along a little bit later. I'm going to start with one of my favourite kinds of poetry, and that is nursery rhymes. This is called Hey Diddle Diddle. Hey Diddle Diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the bed. The little dog laughed, but not for long, because the cow landed right on his head. I don't know if you've heard of Edward Lear. Edward Lear wrote nonsense poems and he was very famous for writing limericks and he popularised limericks in Victorian times. And one of his really famous poems was called The Owl and the Pussycat. So this is my version of The Owl and the Pussycat. The owl and the pussycat went to sea. The owl ate the pussycat. Oh dearie me. That short poem. I, I live in Brighton in England and we live quite close to London. And I used to go to the Natural History Museum in London. It's a brilliant, brilliant museum. And in that museum, they have lots of dinosaurs. And I remember thinking, I wonder if the dinosaurs, when everybody's gone home, do the dinosaurs sort of chat with one another? And that got me to thinking about, what if the dinosaurs, one of the dinosaurs, one of the clever ones, was secretly planning his escape? So I wrote this poem, it's called Escape Plan. As I, Diplodocus, stand motionless in the museum. I am secretly planning my escape. At noon, Pterodactyl will cause a diversion by wheeling around the museum's high ceilings and diving at the curators and museum staff while I quietly slip out of the fire exit and melt into the London crowds. The cunning plan. This is called Farewell Pete. I had a little dinosaur. Nothing would it eat but a chocolate cupcake and my best mate, Pete. At school, it burst the football. It wasn't fond of sports. It gobbled up the goalposts and Mr. Walton's shorts. It chased my Auntie Emma. You should have heard her shout, but it didn't like my granny. In fact, it spat her out. Yes, I live in Brighton. And to get from London to Brighton, um, there's a motorway called the A23, and that becomes the A, no, called the motorway is called the M23, and that becomes the A23, which is a sort of dual carriage road. So it's a, quite a fast road from London down to Brighton. But one day, I was driving back from London, and there was a big accident on the motorway and we all had to find a different route. So there's a sort of a parallel road that goes um, from London to Brighton and it goes all over through the countryside and it goes over the Downs. And the Downs is a big range of hills around Brighton. Even though they go up, that's still called the Downs. Although I suppose they do actually come down when you've gone up. Anyway, they're called the Downs. And uh, I was driving around these little back roads and I came to a sign and it said, beware low flying rabbits ahead. And that got me a bit, a bit um, curious. What does that sign mean? Now I've seen signs that say low flying aircraft ahead. You know, and I've often thought, well, if you do see a low flying aircraft, I don't know what you're supposed to do. You're in a car. You know, do you duck? Does the car duck? I mean, 
How does that work? No idea. But anyway, I, I, I investigated and I discovered there used to be a scientific research base uh, in the Downs. And they used to train rabbits to fly aeroplanes. And they put the rabbit in the cockpit of the plane. And, and, it, would made, and it would be like a model plane about, about, um, yeah, about, about that big. And um, it would have... Um, it would be remote controlled and they'd send the plane up and the rabbit would be sitting in the plane Ooh, what's going on sort of looking out oh there's my barrow down there oh hello and the rabbit would be in the plane and they'd fly it up zzz, it'd be flying around and then they'd turn off the engine zzz, and it would stop just for a few seconds and the rabbit would be like oh it stopped and then they'd start it again zzz, and it would carry on and they and gradually they made that little gap where they stop the engine longer and longer until the rabbit finally works out how to fly the plane they don't do it anymore because now you have drones don't you can have drones that can fly it you know there's no need for it now but quite interesting so i wrote this poem now when i say Beware low-flying rabbits ahead. You have to duck. So you have to duck right down like fast as you can because you don't want the, the, uh, the low-flying rabbit in the plane to knock your head off, okay? So we'll have a little practice, ready? So I don't know where you are at home, if you've got a bit of room, if you're with your family, with your friends on your own, but I'd like you to duck, okay? So let's just try it. Low-flying rabbits ahead, duck! Okay, good. Here we go. Watch out for obstreperous elephants or fidgety fleas in your bed. There's a bear on your chair. Don't stare. Beware. Low flying rabbits ahead. Be warned. Argumentative aardvarks and the tigers haven't been fed. When in doubt, you must shout. There be dragons. Watch out. Low flying rabbits ahead. Caution. Cantankerous catfish. There's a dodo called Fred in the shed. And the mad fortune teller says, Take your umbrella. Low flying rabbits ahead. Be prepared for the lemures' cruel laughter. Don't forget what the old tortoise said. Life is fun when in doubt. Don't worry about those low flying rabbits ahead. I can't have my back in yesterday. I, I can't quite do that with the same vigour and energy that I usually do. But hey, I was very lucky when I was a child because I lived next door to my grandparents. Now, my mum's mum was quite a big woman and she was called Big Grandma. And my mum's dad was quite small and we called him Little Grandad. And they lived in Cowper Road, which was about quarter of a mile away but next door to us lived my dad's mum and dad and my dad's dad was a big jolly man we called him big granddad and grandma was quite small we called her little grandma so we had little grandma big granddad little granddad big grandma and one day um, little grandma came around for a cup of tea and I was playing with my hamster Hammy Hammy the hamster and Hammy and, and I said, "Oh look, Granny, look! Do you like my do you like my hamster?" And she would, she had Hammy the hamster on her hand like this, and he noticed that sort of that kind of hole going up her up her sleeve, and decided to investigate. And many many years later, when I grew up and became a poet, I remembered that, and I've written it into a poem. It's called Hammy Hamster's Great Adventure. He was sitting on Granny's hand when he noticed the opening between the sleeve of her blouse and her arm and decided to investigate. Granny said, oh, ah, uh, ee, ee, ooh, ee, ah, <gasps> ooh, oh, 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 ah, ah, oh, ah, 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 and Hammy, emerging from Granny's left trouser leg, said, Ooh, that was interesting. I think I'll try that again. 
This is a poem called My Dancing Friends, and it's written by a dog. In fact, by a chihuahua called Charlie. So this is My Dancing Friends. You'll find this in a book called The Waggiest Tales, a book that I wrote with Brian Moses. And the book, the whole book is full of poems actually written by dogs. And we had to, we had to sort of source it. We went all over Great Britain uh, looking for dogs who'd written poems, talking to them. And that's how we put the book together. But this is called My Dancing Friends. I'm Charlie the Chihuahua. I dance the cha-cha-cha. And I'd like to introduce you to my many dancing friends. First there's Fred, the friendly foxhound. His foxtrot is quite hectic. Then Sam the Staffy, his square dance is exact and geometric. Pippa Dee the Poodle has a passion for the polka. Meg the Malty Shih Tzu does a marvellous mazurka. Bob the Beagle break dances. He's a fan of hip hop. Liz the Labradoodle has a Lindy Hop that's tip top. Tinkerbell the Terrier is tremendous at the tango. Her tarantella's terrific and so is her fandango. Son the Sussex Spaniel is a star at dancing Zumba and you all applause that schnoodle and his scintillating samba. Sherazard the Schnauzer likes to shimmy and to rumba. Bill the Boxer's dances ballet in a natty little number. Pam the Pointer's on her tiptoes. Her arabesque is like no other. Harriet the Harrier does the hitchhike with her mother. Cole the Collie leads the conga, whereas the Whippet is a waltzer. Marvin the Massive Mastiff is a masterful moonwalker. I'm Charlie the Chihuahua. If you had to choose, you'd pick me. My cha-cha-cha's so wonderful, one day I'll be on Strictly. That's right. Yep. I first found out that animals could write poems when I was taking my dog, uh, Judy, this was a few years ago, down to the beach. And uh, Judy wrote this poem. It was called Stick. It might seem obvious to you humans, but it puzzles me every day. If you want the stick so badly... Why do you throw it away? Yeah. It's a great way to write poems, actually. If you want to write animal poems, just imagine what an animal is thinking. Look at your dog, if you have a dog, or your cat, if you have a cat, or your hamster, or, you know, just when you watch animals, pets, or any animals, really, cows in a field, just think, I wonder what they're thinking. Who is that strange person walking by? And you just write it down. You need a notebook. Write things down in your notebook. Um, and I guess I was throwing the stick for Judy. And you throw the stick, don't you? The dog runs out of the stick and brings it back. And you throw it again and the dog runs out of the stick and throw it. And you throw it again and the dog's like, oh, what's going on? Oh, I'm going to fetch the stick. For and you throw it again. Whoa, you fetch the stick. Anyway, uh, Maybe that's what the dog's thinking. Why on earth is he throwing the stick? We had a cat called Scampy. And at the bottom of our stairs, we had a, like a, um, a wooden table. And on the top was like, it's one of these sort of quite a small table like that, really. And with a goldfish bowl on the top. And in the goldfish bowl uh, lived Trevor, Trevor the goldfish. And Trevor would swim around and around the goldfish bowl. And one morning... We came down the stairs for breakfast, um, and there's the goldfish bowl, no Trevor. Instead, there is Scampy. Scampy sitting by the table going, do, 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 you know, oh, you know, I'm just a cat. Oh, what? No, and we went, you, you eat the goldfish, you naughty, naughty cat, get up, get up, oh, you're we got really, really cross, and Scampy ran out through the kitchen, through the cat through the cat flap. Anyway, when we got home, I got home from work later that evening, and there was a little note pinned on the table. This is what it said. It was a note from Scampy. 
I did not eat the goldfish. It really was not me. At the time of the crime, I was sitting in a tree. I did not eat the goldfish. That's no word of a lie. I loved his silvery fins and his glassy eye. I did not eat the goldfish. I did not touch one golden scale. And I've no idea why there's pondweed hanging from my tail. So there you are. Did he eat the goldfish? Why not? Yeah. Will we ever know? I'm going to tell you a little bit about one of my books that I won an award for. I'm really, really pleased about this book. It's called Apes to Zebras, an A to Z of Shape Poems. You can see it there. And I wrote it with Liz Brownlee and Sue Hardy Dawson. And Sue Hardy Dawson is appearing in the World Poetry Cafe, so you can find her if you have a little look for her. Apes to Zebras. And the thing about this book is they're all shape poems. Okay, now to write a shape poem, you write a poem about an animal, then you draw an outline of the animal, and you write the poem so it fills the outline. I'll show you a couple so you can see. Um, so this is called Blackbird. This is a poem by, uh, by Liz, Liz Brownlee. And there's the poem there. Um, can you see? And if you look, it's, the poem is there. And it's actually written in the shape of a blackbird. Okay. This is uh, it's a whole book. This is Butterfly. This is another of Liz's poems. I don't know if you can see that. So this time, the words are written around the shape of a butterfly. It's something you could try. You could write an animal poem. Find the shape of the animal and draw the outline. I like to have fun with words in this book. This is one of my poems in Brighton we have a lot of seagulls. And the seagulls, if ever you live, leave a bin bag, anything out in their view, they are thinking, ah, oh, food, and they will come down, they will rip open the bin bag, there will be rubbish all the way up the street, you have to be very careful. So this is mine, and I've written this one, it's goals, and this one I've written so that it resembles, look, it resembles a bin bag. And the poem goes like this. Please don't leave your bin bags lying in the street. A fox may tear the bag apart, searching for scraps to eat. A seagull may unravel it, looking for a tasty treat. And neither will be bothered by the mess left in the street. I'm going to read you another poem from this book. This one's called Tiger. And I didn't originate the shape of this. I think either Sue or Liz did the shape. I'm not sure. I think it was Sue, but I'm not sure. It might have been Liz. But there's the shape of the tiger. Can you see that? And um, I'm, going to, I'm going to read it. I've written it out separately, so I'm going to read it from here, which is a little bit easier. And this is based on a story that I heard about somebody in India, there was a tiger in the vicinity, in the neighbourhood, and it was just starting to get dark, and he'd gone down his garden, and he'd just closed the gate, he was lock, sort of locking up for the night, and he met the tiger, and he did something that was, I guess you'd say, was a bit stupid, but he did get away with it, and it's, this is the poem. Tiger. I'd heard the rumours. Strips of blazing sunshine speared the canopy. As I latched the gate, she appeared, a shadow black as night. Larger in real life, massive. She stood before me. I steadied my breath, held back my terror. I stood very still. I blinked several times as you would befriend a cat. In her eyes, sadness, 
and anger. I reached out. Madness. I stroked her behind the left ear. And she was away. Later that evening, the keening cry of a Sambur and all the jungle's million living things paused to pray. That is my tiger poem. Now, at the moment we're in the middle of the pandemic and lots of authors like myself, and musicians, artists, we're not actually able to work and, and earn some of the money we usually earn when we go to schools, when we do gigs and so on. So down the bottom there is, um, I don't know if you can see it, my giant hand will point to it, there it is somewhere. Down the bottom there is a hat, so you could put a little bit of money in the hat if you want to, you don't have to, but it's just there if you'd like to. Or even better, um, buy one of my books, that would be a fantastic thing to do. So thank you, if you do do that, thank you very much. I'm going to give you this idea for a, a, a great idea now for a poem. You need a sheet of paper, such as this one, just get yourself a sheet of paper, and you need a pen. So if you want to just do that now, if you want to pause the video just for a minute while you rush about, get your bit of paper, your pen, something to lean on, all right? I'll wait for you, okay? So just pause it now. Okay, you're back, good. Okay, you got a piece of paper. First thing you need to do is fold the paper. So fold it this way here, down there like so. So you've got a nice sharp fold down the middle of your paper. I don't know if you can see that. Sharp fold. And then you're going to write, in Mr. Magoo's Amazing Zoo, you will find, in Mr. Magoo's Amazing Zoo, you will find, and I've written it here so you can see that we have. In Mr. Magoo's Amazing Zoo, you will find. And quite simply, it's a very simple idea. Down the right hand side, you need to write the names of six animals that you might find in a zoo. So uh, if you want to shout out some names to me, shout them out louder, louder. I'm quite a long way away. Shout them out. Yep, good, tiger, yeah. So I'm going to write down tiger, okay, tiger, giraffe, that's a good one. They can be any animals you like, they don't all have to be, yeah, spider, that's a good one, spider, yeah, spider, lion, lion, zebra, yeah, we need one more, anyone? Zebra, another one, yeah, one more, any animal, come on, there's lots to choose from. Pig. Okay, pig. Right, there we go. And you've got your six animals down that side there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, you need six adjectives to go with the animals. So, tiger, shout out an adjective. Um, terrifying, that's quite a good one. Terrifying, a terrifying tiger, yeah. Giraffe, tall. Okay, tall. Spider, scary. Okay, scary spider. Lion, uh, happy. Happy, happy lion. Zebra, stripey. Zebra, the one for pig. Uh, smelly, smelly pig. Now what you've got there is a poem. Now this is your rough plan of your poem. In Mr. Magoo's amazing zoo, you will find a terrifying tiger, a tall giraffe, a scary spider, a happy lion, a stripy zebra, and a smelly pig. There you are, you have a poem. Now the only thing about this poem is, it is a bit boring. So what you have to do, this is where using your imagination comes into play. Because this bit is dead easy, right? Everybody out there, all of you, you can do that, dead easy. But, a little bit of imagination now. Now some of these w words, we've got terrifying tiger, alliteration, I like that. You can actually, if you want, make all of these alliterate. So these are all 
alliterative. Um, tall giraffe, well, that's not very good, is it? Because why? Giraffes are tall, aren't they? So, tall giraffe. Oh, it's a tall giraffe, is it? Oh, that's unusual. Don't see a lot of tall giraffes, do you? So, you know, tall, that's not very good. This is only rough, isn't it? So I can cross out, add things, that's fine. I'm going to do a, a, a good version of this later. Scary spider, well, again, you know, it alliterates, so that's fine. Happy, like, stripy zebra, same as with the giraffe, you know, stripe. All zebras are stripy, and unstripy zebra would be more unusual, wouldn't it? Uh, smelly pig, well, kind of, it's all a bit boring, isn't it? Maybe you could think of some better animals, really think of some exotic animals. You could actually take one part of the zoo. It could be in the snake house, couldn't it? Or in the insect house, or in the butterfly meadow. I don't know. Um, doesn't have to be a zoo. It could be anywhere where you would keep animals. Any animal building. It could be It could be an event. Okay, they could be poorly animals. It could be a pet shop. What animals do you get in a pet shop? Or it could be uh, a farm. It could all be, these could all be, farm animals down here couldn't they you know could be if you like dinosaurs it could be a jurassic park it could be in mr magoo's jurassic park you will find and these could all be dinosaurs or they could be imaginary it could be an imaginary zoo or a zoo for alien animals you know have fun with it have fun with it doesn't have to be Mr. Magoo. You could put your own name there. It could be in Professor Roger Stevens' Imaginary Zoo. You will find a kalahofalot or hofalofalof. I don't know. I don't know. Have fun with it. It's a really simple idea, but you could come up with some absolutely brilliant poems. I do have a website called The Poetry Zone, and you can see some details of it on my little biography. If you write a really, really brilliant poem, send it to me, and I will put it on my website okay so we're sort of coming up to the last few minutes now i'm going to read you just a couple more poems to finish i hope you've had a good time i hope you've enjoyed all these animal poems what shall i read to finish um this is another of my books the penguin in lost property i do have a shop it's called roger stevens shop or one word dot com and you would actually have to probably buy this book from my shop because it's now out of print. I wrote it with Jan Dean. So I'll read you a couple of poems from here. Um, I'll read you, I don't know, I'll read you this poem about Bob and Marge. And Bob and Marge were our cousins, uh, our uncle, well, they, are, they were our, my uncle, my wife's uncle and aunt, Bob and Marge, and they came over from Canada, and we hadn't known we hadn't known them long, and they visited, and around that time we had two creatures came into our garden unannounced one day. Two cockerels came waltzing into the garden, and we did something you really, really shouldn't do. That's right, we fed them. Why should you never feed cockerels that come wandering into your garden? Because they decided, oh, it's quite nice here, isn't it? Oh, yeah, really lovely. We might as well stay. This could be our new home. Yeah, they feed us and everything. Why don't you want cockerels living in your garden? Because every morning when the sun comes up, that's right, they start cockerelling. But these cockerels weren't really very good at it. This is my poem, Bob and Marge. They wandered into our garden one morning and stayed. Two cockerels, Bob and Marge. Every morning, while the sun was still deciding if it was time to rise, they would start crowing. But they didn't crow, cock a doodle doo, cock a doodle doo. Oh no. Bob would go, A march would go, squee, squee. <laughs> That's how they greeted the new day. It sounded like they were being strangled. It wasn't. 
a pleasant sound. And not really fair on Uncle Bob and Aunt Marge, our Canadian relatives who came to visit us, who didn't want to wake up at 4am before the dawn, in the dark, and Uncle Bob never said, And I never heard Aunt Marge go, There you go. This is the last poem then. Um, it's called Freedom. And again, thinking of that idea of animals writing poems. Um, we had a friend who had a pet tarantula. And she used to keep it in a sort of a glass case. And I was just imagining if it maybe escaped one night and made a bid for freedom. And this could be its poem. It's the last poem I'm going to read. So thank you very much. Thank you World Poetry Cafe uh, for having me here. It's been great. And uh, yeah, keep look after yourselves. Keep safe. These are difficult times. Look after one another. Look out for one another. It's called freedom. Below me, you are fast asleep, but I am out of sight. As I crawl across your ceiling, a black shape in the night. I am heading for the window where the moon lights up the sky. No more small cramped tank of glass my eight arms wave goodbye 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 so long